I've titled the teaching today, God Encounters. God Encounters. Turn to that person next to you and say, God Encounters. <laughs> I, uh, I had a very significant encounter when I was a young man. And uh, it, it, it's probably the reason I'm your pastor today. I, we'd gotten saved, we were going to church. I was probably 13 or 14 years old and was in the youth group and the youth pastor got up, and it was a large youth group, a couple hundred kids, and the youth pastor got up and he goes, this summer we're going to take short-term mission trips. How many of you guys want to go on a short-term mission trip? Everybody's like, yeah. He goes, who here wants to go to Africa? Man, everyone, yeah. He goes, it'll be $3,500. Everybody put their hand back down. He said, uh, who, who wants to go to Europe? We're going to be doing a trip to Germany. Yeah. That's going to be $2,800. Everybody put, put their hand back down. He goes, who wants to go to Haiti? It's the poorest country in our hemisphere. He said, uh, and he started describing how poor it was and how difficult it was. And, and he goes, who wants to go to that? And a couple people lifted their hand. I noticed that the best looking girl in our youth group lifted her hand. And none of the other dudes were lifting their hand. So I was like, I got this. I'm going. I hate to. And, uh, and so I didn't, I didn't know anything about missions. I was, we'd only been saved for a little bit. Mom and dad had put me in Christian school. And, and, so, uh, and so I was going to go to Haiti. And so I started raising money, and I got enough money raised to go to Haiti with them. It was just, there was just a handful of us. I think there wasn't but about five of us that went. And, uh, and of course, my whole plan was to get close to her. She was a year older. She was blonde and blue-eyed. And uh, I thought, this, I'm 14. This is the one I'm supposed to marry, right? And so, and, uh, and so, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm working it. And, uh, and so we, we go to Haiti. We fly into Port-au-Prince. And when we got off the airplane, I'd never seen anything like that. I'd never seen poverty and pain. The first thing the missionary did was brought us to what they called the cardboard city. And as far as you could see, it's just people living under cardboard boxes and any kind of piece of wood or something they could have to kind of lean it up against something. I mean, I'm talking about tens of thousands. I'm not talking about like, like our you know, tent city here or something under bridges. I'm talking about thousands of people, children without parents, just wandering everywhere all throughout the whole city, all throughout the whole nation. Uh, they, these kids are abandoned, and they're three and four years old. And as we were standing there, little kids came up and suh, 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 suh. And uh, the missionary, and I was like, oh, yeah, what do I have? He's like, don't you give them anything. I was like, why? He said, because they'll go buy glue and just so they can huff glue. And I was like, they're four, five years old. He goes, I know. And you could see their eyes were all just bloodshot, just just pain and suffering and, and the difficulty. And, 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 you know, the missionary began to explain to us years ago how much uh, this the, Haiti had been... Um, uh, their state religion, if you will, was voodoo, that they were all into the uh, demonic forces and things like that. And so, you know, I'm a newly saved young man, and he's talking about voodoo and shape-shifting and, uh, you know, stuff like that. And so I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. So we, we did ministry out on the streets, and then he said, hey, we're going to take you guys to this little sub-island, a little fisher, fisher, uh, fishing village, just a little island off the island of, you know, Haiti and, and DR on the same island. And, uh, and so we took this little wooden boat. Uh, no motor, it wasn't motorized, and we packed up uh, generators and projectors, and we we're going to go do basically an outreach, and we're going we're gonna to just, there's some space in, in the middle of this little island. I'm talking about a small little island. And, and there, there were a few hundred people that lived there and had little huts, no running water, no electricity, and so we're going to show the Jesus film. We're going to put it on a screen with a projector, and, and so then we had to wait till it was dark to do that, so we set all up, you know, all day, and then we were waiting, and uh, as it started getting dark, and we were going around trying to tell people, and we got some translators, and some of them knew a little bit of English, and, and so they were walking from hut to hut, and most of them were still out fishing, and so as it got dark, you know, we cranked up the, we cranked up the system, we started playing the Jesus film, they just, they just started coming out of the woods, I mean, because we were all like in this jungle environment within the island, not on the coast, and, and they all just started coming out, and which is really creepy, you know, because all of a sudden, you know, there's 200 people standing there, and then 300 people, and 400 people, we're all standing, because there's no chairs, there's nothing like that, we've just got a projector set up with a film and a couple, uh, with, a, uh, with, a, with a generator powering it, and some, you know, we had some, you know, a little sound system, and so we're standing there, and, and some more people got, you know, I'm getting a little nervous, and so I'm a little further back, and it's pitch black. I don't know if you've ever been in a, in, in a spot where there's no electricity, but it's something. And so it's dark, and we're down in kind of in this wooded area with a little open space, and, and uh, I'm standing there, and we're, we're in the film, and we're watching, and all of a sudden something bumps me. And I look down, and there's a woman on her stomach, and she's slithering like a snake with her hands back here, and she is moving on the ground. And she and and when she hit me, I was like, "Oh no, sir! No, sir! No, 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 no!" Because I saw Poltergeist and The Shining and all those movies. 
So I know that ain't right. I'm telling you that right now. I may not know much about God, but that ain't God right there. I'm going to tell you that right now. And all of a sudden, I watched her, and she got closer to everybody. Without even touching the ground, she raised up without even putting her hands on the ground and was doing like this and, and doing all this stuff. And I was like, oh. So and pitch black, and I'm the only little white dude there, okay? So I run, and I get to missionary. I'm like, um, um, there's a woman with problems. He goes, what's she doing? I was like, well, she's doing this snake thing. I don't know what to call it. He goes, he goes, where at? And he goes, come with me. And he come show me. So I bring him over, and we're standing a few people behind her. And he goes, right there. And, well, by that point, you knew, because she's like, rah, 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 doing all this kind of stuff. So he goes, come on, let's grab. And they had a little chair. They went and got a little chair, and they pulled her off to the side. And, they, and he said, now, help me lay hands on her. I'm like, I ain't touching it. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm 14. We get my, I'm already worried about my Reeboks getting dirty. No, sir, I'm not. No, nah, I don't even want to be here. I was just trying to hook up with her. And she's like, no, 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 no. I did not sign up for this. And so he said, like, come here right now. Lay your hands on her. So we, I put my hands on her, you know, like, you know, trying to touch her. And, we're, and he's praying. And then let go in Jesus' name. And Jesus, he's, and all of a sudden she goes, Wah! And I'm looking at her. And she's looking at me like, who are you? And I'm looking at her like, I know who you are. But well, what am I? You know, it's like that. I'm looking at her, and uh, and and she starts speaking English. She knew English, and she goes, uh, uh, "What just happened?" And uh, and 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 they look at me. I was like, "Well, she was doing the snake thing, <coughs> and then you rose up without touching the ground, and then we started praying for you, and he's like, ah! and that's all I know." And we said, stop in Jesus' name, and now you're free, I guess. I'm looking at the missionary. He's like, yeah. He's jumping around. Yeah. I'm like, oh, great. That encounter with the supernatural was my first ever. In that moment, I, I had an awareness that there is a real devil and a real savior. That there are real forces of evil and real forces of God's goodness. And that they're in combat with each other. And when this little woman got delivered in that moment, and the Bible says it, uh, Mark chapter uh, 19 says, and, and these signs shall follow them. In, in his name will cast out devils. And, uh, and, and, but it marked me. And, 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 and all, I, all of a sudden, I, I didn't really care about, you know, trying to have a girlfriend on a missions trip. And uh, getting a good tan while I'm out, you know, in the Caribbean, you know, whatever. I, I, all of a sudden, I'm marked. Like, there's this real thing happening between light and darkness. There's a real heaven and a real hell. I always knew it here. But all of a sudden now, I'm aware, and so uh, it's an encounter. It's an encounter with the presence of God as, the, as God engages darkness and pushes it back. And I'm right there in the middle of it, and I'm a part of it. And as I laid there that night, and, and we couldn't sleep on the ground, they had us in hammocks. I guess there was more snake people. And so we're in hammocks, and uh, I'm staring up. I, I'm staring up, and everybody else is snoring. They're all sleeping. I'm like, oh, oh, man, oh, man. And I'll never forget, I began to engage with God in a way I had never done before that moment. I said, God, I don't care anymore about being wealthy because that had been my dream. I, I, I don't care about all my little dreams, you know, that I had in my life. And, and what am I, an eighth, ninth grader, ninth grader or something by this point? I don't care about any of this. All I know is that you're real and that darkness is trying to destroy people is real. And here and now, I commit my life to go anywhere you want me to go, to do anything you want me to do, to say whatever you want me to say. I am yours. I'm in the palm of your hand. All I know is I want more encounters with you like this, God, because I don't want to live a mundane, worthless life just going through the motions. And at 14 years old, something shifted inside of me as I had an encounter with the Lord, as I had an encounter with darkness, and I had an encounter with the Lord in that darkness, and it pushed it back. It marked me forever. And can I tell you something? As your pastor, I long for you to have encounters with the Lord that mark you, that shift things in who you are. I, I, I don't want to pastor a church that people are just going through the motions. They go to church, they give a little tip if it was good, and then they go back and they do their little thing. I want you to live life with purpose and reason and meaning. I want you to wake up every day and say, I know my God. I'm telling you right, I don't care what y'all say. I had a moment with him 10 years ago. I had a moment with him yesterday. I know what he is, who he is, and what he's about. 
about because he's marked my life. I want you to have these kind of God encounters in your life that go beyond the just every day being a faithful Christian to these moments where mark, that mark you and transform you into a way that you can never be the same. That's my prayer as your pastor. That's what I cry out for you day and night to have. I don't want to have a little happy church where we come in and have happiness. What I want is a church that has real joy, and that real joy is the result of knowing the real God and having real encounters with him that mark us and say, I don't care what they say in the news. I don't care what he said in that class, and that psych class. I know God. God is real. I don't care what y'all say. All I know is he's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-loving, and all-caring, and it's not a philosophy. It's not a doctrine. It's what I know to be true because I've experienced him and encountered him in a way that I'll never be the same. As I look through scripture, I find that most of the major players, if you will, or people in scripture had these kind of encounters. And if you would oblige me just for a few moments, I just want to extract a couple of them just so I can remind you of what happened in their lives as they encountered God and then the effect therein. Let's look first, first and foremost with Moses. Moses is, as we know, uh, those of us that are Bible people, you know, uh, we know that Moses, God used him to do some great, crazy, cool things. Um, but it, let's back up to kind of where all of this started. So if you don't know the, the life of Moses in Scripture, let me kind of bring you back. Maybe some of you saw, you know, the Disney version, you know, uh, what was it called? The little cartoon thing. It was, uh, uh, the, what was it called? Prince of Egypt. Maybe some of you saw that 20 years ago. And so there was some good truth in that. But what happens is the children of Israel are the Jews or the Hebrews, if you will. They have been conquered. They have become enslaved to the Egyptians. The Egyptians are using them to build their pyramids. They, they are the slaves of Egypt. And, um, and God begins to hear their cry because they're slaves for 500 years. And somewhere towards the end of that 500 year mark, God begins to say, okay, all right, you've learned your lesson. The reason why is because they had been God's people, but they turned their back on God. So God said, well, if you turn your back on me, I can't protect you. And then Egypt was able to come in and, and capture them and make them slaves. And so they begin to cry out, like, wasn't, didn't we serve a God back a few hundred years ago? Yeah, uh, the God of Abraham, that's right, and, and we've lost him, and well, let's find him again. And they begin to cry out, so God said, okay, I'm going to send you a deliverer. I'm going to raise up somebody that will be a deliverer. Well, what happened was Pharaoh hears that God is starting to speak, that I'm going to send someone, and, 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 and realizes that, it, that God is going is to send a Hebrew boy that's going to be the deliverer. So Pharaoh begin, puts an edict act that all babies under the age of two have to be murdered because he doesn't want anybody to rise up and he believes in the supernatural pharaoh does and so he recognizes that there's something happening here well the midwives when 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 um when moses's mom has given birth they take that baby and protect that baby and then the mom goes and puts that baby when he, after she finishes nursing him after hiding him for all these months from all the officials and all the you know the authorities takes that baby and puts Moses in a little basket, some of you know the story, and floats it down the river where Pharaoh's daughter is taking a bath. She sees the baby, has compassion on the baby, and adopts this Hebrew baby. So Moses grows up in the palace. He is the step-grandson, if you will, of Pharaoh at the time. He, he, he gets trained by the best. He is, an, all, by all rights, an Egyptian, adopted in as an Egyptian. Right under the nose of Pharaoh, the deliverer God put him right there. Well, there comes this moment as Moses is a little older where he obviously recognizes his heritage, knows that he is of the bloodline of Jews, and he sees this, this Egyptian beating a Jewish man, and he intervenes, and then the Egyptian turns on him and he kills him. And when he does that, he thinks, Pharaoh's going to kill me now. He's going to recognize and remember who I am, and I'm going to take off. So he takes off and he flees to Hebron. And he's in Hebron for 40 years out in the desert plains, if you will. He's taking care of sheep. He goes from, if you will, one of the most powerful positions he could be in to now he's out in the wilderness, if you will, taking care of sheep, which is the poorest job that anyone could have. It is the most worthless job anyone could have. And he's out there taking care of sheep when he has a God encounter. He, Exodus chapter 3 kind of begins to line out as he's walking in the wilderness out with these kind of in a deserty region he noticed a bush off in the distance in its own fire which was probably commonplace for that type of uh, arid environment and as he watches it it never burns out and it piques his attention 
And he goes, I'm going to go check this out. Let's pick up in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4. The scripture's on the screen for you. It says, and when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. I don't know when the last time a bush talked to you like that. It was on fire, you know, in your backyard or something. God starts talking to him. And in a burning bush, so it's on fire, it's in flame, and God starts speaking to him, and he says, Moses, Moses. And the reason why I said it real loud, because it had exclamation marks right there. <laughs> and Moses said, here I am. That's pretty smart, like I don't know who that is, but here I am. Verse 5, don't come, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Buddy, I am here in all my power don't come any closer because you're going to fry and die if you get any closer. Not only that, in reverence for who I am and my power, you buy, probably ought to take off your sandals in a sign of submission and, and reverence. And so in verse 6 he says, then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, look what Moses does. He has an encounter with God. What, what's his immediate response? At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Most people believe that he took off his, his sandals and he hid his face by getting down on his face, kneeling down in the dirt right there in the presence of God. And then God begins to speak to him. He says, listen, I have picked you to go liberate my people. I have picked you. I want you to go at, stand up. I want you to go back. And I want you to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses goes, uh, no, 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 I, 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 I can't do that. I have a st stuttering problem. And God says, I can fix that. You don't worry about that. He goes, well, how do I know? No, 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 they're going to listen to me. He says, what you got in your hand? He says, I got, I, I got the staff. He says, throw it on the ground. He throws it on the ground. It turns into a snake. Moses is like, whoa, how did that happen? He said, reach it, grab it again. And I, ain't, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't grab snakes. I grab snakes with a hoe or a shovel. That's the only way I grab them. I cut their heads off. He says, grab a hold to it. He grabs a hold to it. It turns back into a staff. He says, now you go and you do what I've told you to do. I want you to know that one encounter, that one encounter with, with God marked Moses. He leaves his place. He leaves his little job, his 40 years of what am I doing with my life. And that one encounter shifted it all. And he marches right on in to Egypt. <laughs> and he gets an appointment with the Pharaoh. And he stands in front of him and says, G -g God says, let my people go. And then he throws down his staff. And they have this engagement with the staffs. If you'll keep studying the storyline, as you know probably from the movie, ten plagues have to come because Pharaoh won't let go. Moses ends up leading all of God's people out of Egypt into the wilderness and becomes, if you will, one of the greatest leaders in biblical history because of one encounter with the living God. Let's look at another person in Scripture. I was thinking about this one. I love this one, obviously. And how about Mary, the mother of Jesus? She's a teenage kid. Some scholars believe she was around 14, 15 years of age. She's engaged to be married. You thought your daughter was old or young getting married. 14, 15 years of age, engaged to be married to Joseph, when all of a sudden God shows up. He sends his angel to have a conversation with Mary. And let's pick that up, if you will, for just a moment, right here in Luke chapter 1 and verse 30. It says, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Why did the angel tell her not to be afraid? Because she was scared. It's not real deep. If an angel shows up in your house, I promise you, you're going to be scared. Because <laughs> the presence of God. And so he says, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Verse 31 of Luke chapter 1. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. He says, sweetheart, guess what? You're going to give birth to the Messiah. In this engagement, she goes, I, I, how is this going to happen? I've never been with a man. You know, the Holy Spirit is going to give you the power of God's going to come over you, and the Messiah is going to be within you, and you are going to give birth and raise the Messiah. Can you imagine being 15, 16 years old, raising God? Like, do you spank him? <laughs> like, don't. Well, I guess you can. You're God. I mean, you could do that. I mean, every time you go to bathing, the water splits. I mean, it's a difficult thing to do and she's been picked to do this but can you imagine though over the years can you imagine when he's 31 years old in his ministry and they're going what 
You ain't the Messiah. You work down the road. You a carpenter. You built my friend's house. Oh, no, you ain't the Messiah. Can you imagine what she's feeling as neighbors? And she's watching Insta Story, and they're talking bad about him and saying he's not really the... And can you imagine the doubt that she must be... But she goes back to, I guarantee you, she goes back to the encounter that she had. Said, whoa, 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 God showed up. God sent an angel to me and told me this was going to happen, and it's happening. So I don't care what y'all think. Y'all might not say he's the Messiah. You may think he's an everyday dude, but let me tell you something. I had a moment when I was 15 years old, and God encountered me, sent an angel to speak to me. I've never been the same. I got pregnated by the Spirit of the Lord God, not by a man. This is God's son, and this is the one that he said it would be, and he's the Messiah. Where did she get that kind of faith and confidence from? Because she had an encounter that marked her and shifted everything about her. And I need you to know, you're not just a kid who's 14, 15 years old. You're a person who God wants to mark for the rest of your life to do big things. You're not just a person who's working a job out in a wilderness, just trying to go through it. God wants to encounter you, mark you, shift you, and cause things to happen that you never thought would happen. Because he did not put you on this planet just to work a job, just so you could feed your family, just so you could die and let them do that all over again. He has a plan and a purpose, and he wants to mark you. But you and I have to have these God encounters. How about this next one? How about, how about the, the disciple Peter? Peter is a fisherman. He's got a good business going. He's got a good business. He's just minding his own business. Luke chapter 5. He's been working all night. He's, he, he's, he's expanded. He started with one little boat out there fishing. Got his little brothers working for him. Then they were able to purchase another boat. And they expanded. They got two boats going out. Now, man, they got like, the people are buying a lot of their fish from the market. Now they got, they got a contract with this market over here and this market over there. So they've added a third boat, maybe even a fourth boat. He's got it going on. And they fished in the night. And, man, they come in one particular morning. They hadn't caught anything. He's already made it to shore. He's standing out in the water. His boat is tied off. He's standing out washing his nets. He's washing his nets. And here comes this preacher dude. Comes over the hill and all these people are following. Ooh, ooh, pray for me, pray for me. He's like, yeah, 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 come here, come here, yo, Father, Son, my name, amen. And he's putting them, and, he, and he's getting people healed. And then, and, then, and then this guy looks at him and says, hey, Peter, do you mind if I sit in your boat, maybe kind of push it out just a little bit? That way I can give some space between me and the people and they can sit down and I can teach them a little bit? Uh, sure, I mean, you're that Jesus guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been following you a little bit on Insta story. I, that's crazy about the blind guy. That's pretty, that's pretty legit, bro. Yeah, come on, man. Sit, sit in my boat. That'd be awesome. I, I got to keep working, though, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, keep working. Keep doing what you got to do. And Jesus starts teaching them. They all sit down. They're all sitting on the seashore, you know, on the, the shore of the little big giant lake. And he's teaching them. And, and Peter's listening to this like, dude, that's legit. Wow, that's amazing. I ain't never heard nobody talk like that. That's, that's awesome. Wow, that's cool. And all of a sudden, Jesus looks at him. He says, hey, Peter. I'm kind of finished with my message. Looks like you hadn't caught anything, man. We hadn't caught anything all night long. It's going to be, a, I don't know if I'll be able to make payroll. He said, a couple of the boats are still coming in. He says, well, won't you yell out to them? Stop right there and, 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 and dip on that other side. There's some fish right there, I'm telling you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're a preacher. I'm a fisherman. There ain't no fish today. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's just not happening. Our, the sun's already come up. It's, you know, mid-morning. I, I, it's not a good time to fish. Just do it, Peter. Hey! the other side okay they start pulling it in and the bible says that they caught so many fish that their boat began to sink so then they're like help and they said go get them and these other guys are getting in the boat trying to get out to them and they're trying to get all the fish going and it's this moment jesus is sitting there <laughs> and all of a sudden you know peter looks at him he goes no sir you need to get away from me because I'm a wicked dude and you obviously are God. And I just, whoa, no. I mean, this, I, he has this encounter with Jesus. And then let's pick up right there in verse 10 of Luke chapter 5. Then Jesus said to Simon or Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore. Look what it says. Left everything and did what? Followed him. He had such an encounter with the living God that he's like, I'm done. Pull the boats up. Let's go. Wherever you go, I'm going. He shuts his business now. Can you imagine? He breaks contract with all these guys that he's, that he's supplying fish for. He just walks away. Pulls the boats up. Throws the nets off to the side. Walks away and goes and follows Jesus because of one encounter with the living God. Can I tell you something? I know people who've had encounters with God because they're never the same. 
They're never the same. They, something has shifted inside of them. When you've had an encounter with God, you don't look at people the same way you used to. When you've had an encounter with God, you don't look at God as some dead religious duty that you have to go to on Sunday and give a little bit of money so everybody be, get, get off your back, but you go ahead and live the way you want to live and try not to be bad. That is not an encounter with God. When you've had an encounter with God, it shifts everything about you. Something happens on the inside of you, revelation of who you are, what you're supposed to be doing with your life, why you're here on this planet, all of a sudden comes alive. And this dude had a good business going, has this engagement with Jesus, this encounter with the living God. And he says, that's it, I'm, I'm leaving it all, I'm, I'm with you, let's go. Let's go catch men then. I, obviously you got this thing figured out, and you're God, and I'm following you. How about this next one, and we'll kind of kind of, wrap up these imageries here, and, and that is the Apostle Paul. How about the Apostle Paul? As, as you know, the Apostle Paul is one of the great leaders of the New Testament church. But he wasn't always that. In fact, as we pick up in the book of Acts, where we're going to look at this engagement that he had here in chapter 9, he's actually going by his name Saul, which is his Jewish name. Later, he takes on his Roman name, Paul, because he wanted the Greeks, the, the Romans, to be able to bond with him as he's out preaching to the Greeks and the Romans. But he's going by his name Saul. And what has transpired is Jesus has died, resurrected, and then this church has emerged, or the way. They called it the way. They didn't really call themselves Christians at the time. They called it the way, those who followed Jesus, the Messiah. And that's directly threatening Judaism, of which Paul has been one of the chief young dudes coming up in Judaism. He's hoping for a high position as one of the chief rabbis. He actually wants to be on, you know, on, the, on the council. And so he's working this political angle. And there's this threat of this little group of people called the way who said that this guy that, that was killed actually resurrected. But, but Paul doesn't believe it. Or Saul doesn't believe it's happened. And, they're, and, and, they're, and he's fired up about it. And he sees that as a threat. So he has, to, he has to destroy the way. He has to destroy these Christians lest they pervert and manipulate Judaism because they're saying that it was a fulfillment of everything that they believe in Judaism was fulfilled in this guy named Jesus the Messiah so Paul is so angry about it that he takes the charge man these guys we can't let these guys have any traction we got to stamp uh, stomp them out so he begins to go and get powers uh, uh, authorities to, to get behind him and so he gets letters of approval to put him in jail and then once they get him in jail I don't know how they died Ooh, I don't know they must have made somebody mad. So they're getting killed in prisons. And he's taking these Christians and he's tracking them down. In this particular incident that we're going to look at in Acts chapter 9, he's on his way to a city called Damascus. And he's got, he's got, he's got guys going with him. He's going to show, uh, show the letters of approval to get the local authorities to come and get these Christians. He knows who they are. They've been tracking them covertly. And they know who they are and they're going to go get them. And Paul is on, or Saul, as he's being called at this moment, is on his way. Now let's look at his encounter in verse 3 of Acts chapter 9. It says, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him Saul Saul why do you persecute me this dude's going about his business he's driving his f-250 he's on his way to Damascus and all of a sudden light encompasses him <laughs> come on you saw aliens you know <laughs> right it encompasses him and then a voice Saul Saw, I mean, it comes through his speaker system. I mean, the bows is like, it's just rocking. Why do you persecute me? Now, my favorite thing, I think this is a funny thing, is how he responds. I don't know about you, but if that happened, I'd be like, what the what? That's not what he does. He says, who are you, Lord? I guess that's the right response. So let me just say, if you're driving to work tomorrow, and a great light comes into the cab of your vehicle, Probably the right response is to be, who are you, Lord? I don't know. I wouldn't have thought to do that. He goes, who are you? He recognizes that whatever this is is more powerful than me. So I'm going to say, who are you, Lord? And then the response is, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. I, whap, I'm Jesus, sucker. <laughs> it knocks him to the ground. Knocks him on his boot behind as my daughter says. And he is looking in all this light, and he's having this engagement, this encounter with the living God. 
And he recognized, whatever this is, it's God. But who? Who are you going by? What's your name? I am Jesus, who you're persecuting. Revelation. Everything that I thought I was doing right is so wrong. I can tell people who've had an encounter because they don't love sin anymore. Everything that I loved and enjoyed and I thought was right and I, enjoyed, and I made excuses for it and I did it. That's wicked. I don't want that. And for the next three days, he's blinded. He, he, he can't see. And if you'll continue reading in that passage, you'll find that God goes and grabs another Christian and says, I need you to go pray for this dude. And he's like, no, I am not. That dude's wicked. I ain't. No, he's my man. He's just had an encounter with me. And if you'll study out the New Testament, you'll find that Saul, who then starts going by his Roman name, Paul, he writes two-thirds of your New Testament. He heals the sick and raises the dead. He's martyred for Christ. You find out that even in one engagement, as he's preaching in a city that doesn't want to know about Jesus, they grab him, take him out to the, to the, to the dump where they throw all the trash. They stone him, leave him for dead. Most scholars believe that he literally was dead. And that then the Christians come, what's everybody's left, and raise him from the dead. We're talking about a phenomenal man of God. Most of our solidification of doctrine comes from his teachings and his writings that God used him. This man had been a God hater, a Jesus hater, and in one encounter becomes the hero of our faith. One of the great heroes of our faith. I want you to understand something. You and I need encounters with the living God. Not just one, not just two. Every day, every week. Moments that mark us where we go, I, I, I'll never be the same from that. Some of you can point to a little moment, but maybe it was ten years ago. Maybe it was two years ago. And as your pastor, I'm praying, oh God, oh God, please encounter these people. Encounter your sons and daughters. Some of us keep him so far in a distance that he can't get past our hand. And we're like, God, I'm, I'm happy. I'm comfortable right here. I've got, I've got my, little, my little life. I've got my little thing. And you're scared to encounter him in a deep way. He wants to mark you, encounter you, continuing to encounter you, and to change your life forever. Now, you take Haiti away, and I'm not your pastor. You take that encounter that I had when I was 14 years old, and I'm not your pastor. This moment is not happening. Encountering the living God, shifting, maneuvering, building the direction of our life. And I want to give you a couple of thoughts. When you and I have encounters with the Lord, they have a few effects on us. I want to give you three effects of a God encounter. Number one, the first thing that happens is it shifts your value system. When you have an encounter with the living God, it shifts your value system. You don't care about what you thought was so valuable. Uh, eighth, ninth grade, somewhere in that range, we'd been serving the Lord for a few years, and Mimi and Pop decided, hey, let's put him in a Christian school. That'll be good for him. That'll fix him, you know, put him in a Christian school. And so the summer that I was, before the, I was going in to the Christian school, we get a letter just days away from school starting, and they said, hey, listen, the weekend before school starts, we want to take all the students away for a retreat. And we want to be sure they really experience God. And so I'm mad. Like, why do I have, aren't you paying to put me in this school? They can't take my weekends too. They don't get to own you like that. That ain't right. I don't even know these people. I ain't even met these people. I'm a, I don't go on a retreat and I got to stay in a dorm room. with. The, I don't even know these people. So I show up, I'm already ticked off about it. I show up, and man, I'm telling you, now you got to understand, as your pastor, who, you know, I'm a little older now, but can you imagine me as a teenager, how spastic I was? Just let your mind wander for a moment, <laughs> and then come back in. <laughs> so I'm sitting in these meetings, right? And I'm sitting on the back row, just, just like you would have done. I'm sitting on the back row, I'm so mad, and this guy's terrible, he, womp, 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 womp. Womp, 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 womp. I'm like, oh, God, shut up. Jeez, when is this going to be over? Man, why do I have to do this? And I had to pay for it. That's what ticked me off. And so I'm sitting there. I'm so bored. Dear God.
God, I'm so bored. And I just, I just can't take it. I've made a few friends, and I've kind of, you know, if I make friends, I'm going to become their leader, you know. So I'm their little leader. You're like, dude, this sucks, huh? Yeah, yeah, this sucks. That's right. It sucks, huh? This, this sucks. Yeah, this sucks. That's right. This is terrible. And I'm sitting there. I'm so bored out of my mind. And they've given us little papers so we could fill in the notes while he's preaching and stuff. And so, and so you know, I, I take one of the papers, and, and I start making a paper airplane. Which is a common thing that only children do uh, when, you, when your parents don't have nothing fun for you to do. They give you a piece of paper and stick you in the back room and say, do something. Anyway, so I, I was a pretty good paper airplane maker. And so, and so I'm making this paper airplane. And the whole time I'm doing it, you know, there's this little dude a couple rows over sitting at the end of the row. And he is that kid. Amen. That is so good. Amen. I'm like, oh, I hate that kid right there. That kid's such an idiot. And he's like, hey, this is awesome. This is great. Amen. Amen. And I'm like. I'm going to get that sucker right there, watch. And so I'm sitting there, you know, and I start making the paper airplane, and I get this idea. I'm going to hit him with it. I'm going to hit him with this thing. Because I made it real small like a dart. I mean, it was like a little dart. I was like, watch this, right? And so the guy's preaching, womp, 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 womp. And when he turns this way, I chunk that thing. And I'm telling you, every demon in hell guided that piece of paper. It flew and hit this little nerdy kid right in the temple. And he started squealing like a little girl. Ah! Ah! And so all my friends are like, ah, you the man. But because I'm a smart kid, I'm like, oh, my goodness, what happened? What happened? Now, because this is a Christian school event, you don't have counselors. You have teachers. And every one of those teachers are like, somebody hit Joseph. (laughs) (laughs) Which one is it? So I see, I know they're coming for me. So I'm playing it off. Like, oh my goodness, in the name of Jesus, we just pray for Joseph. We don't know what happened to Joseph, Lord, but we just pray for him right now. And so, and so, and, and all my dudes, they're like, and I'm like, oh my goodness, Joseph. And the guy preaching just stops. And he starts looking right at me. Son, you right there, come here. Come here. Now you have to understand. This ain't my first rodeo, so I'm playing it off. I'm like, hey, he's talking to you right there. He wants you to go far right there. So then the guy starts calling me out. No, you, son, in the pink shirt, which Adam airbrushed brushed across the front of it. Y'all don't judge me. It was the 80s. Don't you judge me. And that wasn't pink. That was fuchsia. And we all had our name airbrushed. Come on, somebody. And so, and so I'm thinking, I'm busted. Oh, my goodness, I'm busted. And so I get up, and he's like, and, and, and then all the teachers are like, mm, we got you, the little devil kid coming to our Christian school. Uh-huh. And so I start walking up, and it's amazing how many lies you can come up with in about a 10-foot section of space that you have to cover. So I'm thinking, I'm, it ain't mine. I ain't do that. Because I'm thinking he must have saw me. I didn't throw that thing. I didn't throw that. But then I realized, wait a minute, the best lie is to put a little bit of truth in it. So I started thinking, you know what? That's what I'm going to tell him. Sir, that was my paper airplane. And the reason why I had to own it, because I realized my name was written on it, and I'd forgotten to take my name off the piece of paper before I threw it. (laughs) So I got to own it. So, sir, that was my piece of paper, and I made a paper airplane. But I was just holding it because I was so concentrating on what you were sharing about that, that stuff you were sharing. Like, I was, like, I was so listening and my friend hit my hand, and, and it just went over there. And I thought, that's not going to be good enough. Then, it, then I got a good one. I'm almost in front of him, and it comes to me. Sir, I made that paper airplane, but I had it sitting in my Bible with my Bible open. And I don't know what was happening up front, but in the back where we were, it was as though the wind of the Holy Ghost began to blow, sir, like the day of Pentecost. It was as though fuego del Espíritu Santo began to rest upon us. And all of a sudden, the wind of God, I don't know if y'all felt it up front, but back where we were at, the wind of God began to blow. And all I know is as the wind of God blew across my Bible, right there across my chest, it picked up that paper airplane and nailed that kid in the head, which I interpret as he got sin in his life and the Lord trying to point him out and using me as a prophet <laughs> to help him. <laughs> so I'm ready for it. And I stand right in front of him and everybody's like, oh, 
place is real quiet. A couple hundred kids, they all quiet. All the teachers are like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he says, raise your hands and close your eyes. Well, he don't realize is that I'm from the hood. I don't ever raise my hands and close my eyes. <laughs> right? If somebody says, stick them up, you might raise your hands. But I ain't going to close my eyes. I want to see where you're going to stab me at. You know, I'm like, I'm not going to close my eyes in the process. And, he, and I'm like, uh-uh, I'm not doing it. And he said, I said, raise your hands. So I raised my hand. But I, and he said, close your eyes. So I was smart now. I just did like that where I could still see him. <laughs> and then he starts prophesying. He says, I see, God says, you're like Dennis the Menace. Now, only those a little older know who that is. And so, as soon as he said that, all the teachers were like, amen, you got him now, go ahead, ha, go ahead, pastor. And I'm like, shut up, y'all don't know me. God says, he's going to take that personality and all that mischievousness. And he wants to use it to bring about great change for your generation. God says he's going to put you on stages overseas in front of thousands. You'll see great miracles, great healings, great deliverance. God says he's going to use you to raise up the next generation of great leaders that will usher in the last day's revival into the world. God says he's picked you. You are a revivalist for your generation. He's halfway into that thing, and I'm experiencing the power of God. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but when God touches me, I begin to weep. I just can't stop it. And I just, I just, I, I'm crying. And you know, when you really are getting touched by God, and you're really crying, what happens is not only do the tears come, but then the snot comes. <laughs> and you know, there, there ain't no one ever watching you when you really got a snot fall. And so, <laughs> and it's like just dripping all down. <laughs> and so, I don't know what else to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> I start wiping all down my shirt, right? That's how you know you were encountering God when you got snot all down your shirt. That moment shifted everything that I valued. That moment shifted everything that I thought was important in life. That moment I said, you know, I don't care if we have big houses and nice cars, Jamie. When I refer back to, baby, this is where we're at, it's because I refer back to that moment. Where I encountered God and God said, I want you to do this and I want you to be this and I'm going to do this. In one moment, it took, him, it took him all of 90 seconds to tell me what God said. That encounter shifted everything. Everything that I valued. I didn't care anymore if I had the best clothes. I didn't care if, if I was the funniest anymore or the coolest anymore. It shifted all I cared about in that moment was doing what he told me to do. Because all of a sudden, my life had meaning and reason because I had an encounter with the living God. Have you ever had an encounter with the Lord? Has he ever encountered you to a place where you shifted what you care about? I'll tell you something. When you encounter him like what I'm talking about, like we see the people of the Bible encountering him, what I know Christians for hundreds of years, how they've encountered him, when you have these kind of encounters with the Lord, not only will it shift everything you value, but the second thing that it will do, it will shift your appetites. It will shift your appetites. The Bible says in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. When you encounter the living God, when you have these kind of God encounters, it shifts your appetites. Alcohol just doesn't have, it just doesn't have a flavor that you care about anymore. Pornography just doesn't, it just doesn't do it anymore. Living for your own self-pleasure, that, that boat, that jet ski, that, 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 that house, that pulling into the driveway going, I've accomplished something. It just, it loses its luster. It, sin literally loses its ability to tempt you. When you have an encounter with God like that, your appetites begin to change. You can't just have more and more and more. I got to get more. I got to get more drunk. I got to I gotta smoke, more, smoke, smoke more, more weed. I mean, I, listen, I've watched this time and time again with people in my life that I've ministered to and, 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 and been there, and they'll come to me and say, Pastor, it's amazing. I, I got radically touched by God in that moment when we were all praying. Remember that? And I'm like, yeah, I remember, bro. God was touching you, bro. You were encountering him. It's amazing, Pastor, because, you know, a couple weeks ago, I was struggling, so I, I went out, you know, I, I was, smoked up, you know, a blunt or something, you know, and I couldn't, I couldn't get a buzz. I know, because your appetites have changed. Your appetite changed because you encountered his goodness and his power. And the rest of it doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't, Pastor. It's worthless, isn't it? Yes, sir, it's worthless. That's why I live the way I live. That's why I'm as passionate as I am. Not because that's a hype moment or just my personality. I've had so many encounters with the Lord that I, I, I'll never be the same. And I want a church 
that has had encounters with the Lord. I don't want to pastor people who just want to go sit in a service and hear a good message. I, I want to pastor people who say, you're not going to believe this, Pastor. I was driving to work, and uh, all of a sudden, it was like God's presence came in the cab. I was listening to this little Bible app thing. And all of a sudden, he began to speak to me. I had to pull over to the side of the road. I began to weep uncontrollably. Pastor, I don't weep about nothing. I don't cry about nothing. And all of a sudden, I, I heard his voice speaking to me in my heart, my mind. I don't know if it was like real out loud or just down in my heart. And I, Pastor, and guess what he told me? He told me this. He told me that. He told me this. That's, that is what genuine Christianity looks like. That's what he has for you. Standing at arm's length, keeping him at a distance so you can't really get close to him. Friend, that is the mistake of a lifetime. Here's the third thing that happens when we have God encounters, or the third effect on our life, and that is it will remove the limitations. It'll remove the limitations. Some of you still struggling with the same sin that you were struggling with last year, and the year before, and the 10 years before that. What you need is an encounter. God never intended you to be powerless. Did you know that? He never intended you to be powerless. Jesus, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, he tells his disciples, he says, go and wait for the gift that my father has promised. See, what God did, if you look back over the history of God following, the Jews predominantly are all the scriptures are talking about his people. You'll find that he gave them a law. He showed them what right and wrong was. He said, this is right and this is wrong. This is, this is righteousness. This is sinfulness. And he gave them a law so they would even know what it was. And he said, now I want you to live righteously. They couldn't do it. They were always going back into sin. Always going back to sin. And so that created the fact that they were unforgiven. So they can't be in God's presence as sinners. So God said, you know what? I'm going to fix that once and for all. I'm going to send my son Jesus. He's going to die for that sin, which bridges the gap. So if you'll come to Jesus, that will give you access to me. Because through Jesus, you're cleansed, made righteous, and then you can have access to me into my presence. And so Jesus died on the cross. And then Jesus said, now listen, Dad doesn't just want to do that for you, forgive you, but he also wants to empower you. So he says, go and wait for the gift my father's promise. That's, out of, that, that's that passage where he says, and, and, and I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. On sons and daughters will prophesy. That's what the gift was about, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on us. And two things happen when the Holy Spirit comes in your life. And, and when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and lives and abides in you, and he begins to regenerate you. He begins to make you new. When I wasn't a Christian, I was not convicted at all. I would cuss you. I would punch you in the face. I would steal from you. Why not? That's, I'm going to get ahead. You in the way. I didn't feel convicted at all. When I became a Christian, I began to be convicted. Why? Because I'm being regenerated. I'm being remade into his image. But there's a second work that happens throughout this process with the Holy Spirit. And that is he will also baptismo you or baptize you. He will fill you with power so that you can overcome your own sin. So that you can overcome sickness and disease. And the most miserable thing for me is to watch Christians who have no power. And they love God, and they're being regenerated, but they just can't. They have no power to overcome, and they're always, Pastor, would you pray for me? Pastor, will you pray for me? Yes, I'll pray for you. I, I, I wish you had power, though, because then you wouldn't have to be borrowing my power. You ever had a neighbor come and plug into your electricity at your house? You're like, what you doing? Well, we didn't, couldn't pay the bill, so you mind if we borrow some electricity? No, go get your own bit of electricity. And so that's why people get addicted to ministers. I'm, just, I'm not your power source. I'm just a quarterback. you the best wide receivers in the world, the best running backs, the best blocking backs, best defensive backs. I'm just the guy just getting you the ball and let you run. That's my role. My role is not. I am not the power source. He is. And that's why we don't need a priest anymore. He says, you don't need another priest. You don't know anybody to come between me. Jesus did that once and for all. And then I give you my power, the power of the Holy Spirit, living and abiding in you, giving you the ability to overcome that temptation, to say, no, you will not. No, you won't, Satan. Not today, not tomorrow, not yesterday, no more. I take my authority place, and I say, no, let go. And when you pray for people, they get healed. You say, well, that, that didn't happen with me. You need an encounter. And you need to have the power of God flowing through you. It will remove all the limitations when you have these encounters with the Lord. Some of you had encounters back in the day. That's awesome. You're still talking about 1978. That was awesome. But we see in Scripture fresh encounters with the Lord daily, weekly, monthly. You're still talking about what happened. You know, that one time you prayed for that person that had a little bit of a headache, you know, 10 years ago. That's awesome, and I'm so proud of that. But there's so much more. And I love you so much as your pastor. And it's so important to me that you have encounters with the Lord. That I've actually, I've actually set into place that we would have, we would have these moments where we gather on a Friday night and come get before the Lord and say, Lord, we want to encounter you. 
I, I actually carved them into our calendar and asked our leaders, our pastors and ministers to fast and pray that, that you would come to these moments with us and we could encounter God and that you could, you could have these impactful moments. I, I don't want you just to have them in meetings, though. I want you to have them in your living room. I want you to have them in your small group. I want, I want you to have these encounters with the Lord that just mark you. You say, listen, I don't care what everybody says. All I know is I was this and God spoke to me, he, and th that person laid their hands on me, and, and I, know he ain't, I know he ain't that righteous, because I know that dude, but when he prayed for me, something shifted. I mean, I'm telling you, God encountered me, he spoke to me, I'm telling you right now, that's why I want you to have relationships in this body of believers. This Friday night, we're actually going to do, we do them quarterly, we call it an encounter. And I'd like to see each and every one of you have these kind of moments with us. I'd like you to have a, a, an encounter with the Lord. But I'll tell you this, I learned something over the years. People who've had great encounters with the Lord, there's a couple dynamics in their life. First thing was they recognized they needed a shift. They recognize they're, they're in a mundane just cycle like a treadmill. There's a lot of energy, but they're not getting anywhere. The other thing I noticed about people who have these encounters with the Lord, not only did they get kind of desperate and realize like they needed a shift, but they also begin to position themselves. They begin to, they begin to position themselves to encounter the Lord. They begin to say, you know, whatever I got to do. They begin to position themselves. And the other thing that I realized that they did was they began to prep themselves to receive whatever God had for them. And so this week, if you're interested in coming to the counter with us, you, you have to register. I'd like you to go to our website or through the app. And then what happens is I have a little preparatory thing that I want you to do throughout the week. I've, made, I've, I've put some teachings together, so that so, so, some digital guides so that you can kind of get ready so that when you get here Friday night, all, all you're ready to do is receive and encounter. And I promise you, something's going to happen for you. It's happened to me. It continues to happen to me. It continues to happen to people in our church. And you need an encounter with the Lord. You need to be marked again. You need a refreshing again. You need to experience. And let me tell you something. In our encounters, what, what we do is we're going to help you break sin habits. We're going to minister to you to break sin habits. Because most sin is habitual, right? You had a bad day, so you just go get drunk. It's, it's, not, it's not a lot that you want to go get drunk. You just, it's, just, it's, it's a habit. It's what you do whenever this happens or when things like this happen. The other thing, some of you have generational curses on your life. You don't even know about it. You didn't even realize. You didn't know that was a thing. And we want to help you break those. We said, what's a generational curse? I'll give an example. Your, your dad was a pervert. Your grandfather was a pervert. And you struggle with perversion in a way that's unprecedented. That's a curse. We've got to break that. We do that through prayer and intercession and demanding that it be loosened. And apply the blood of Jesus to that place. Your grandmother had breast cancer. Your mama had breast cancer. And now you're scared of dying of breast cancer. Your family's been poor for three and four generations. Those are things that have to be broken. That's scriptural. It's biblical. All throughout scripture, we find that we have to break those generational curses. Some of you have never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. You know the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, but you don't know the power to overcome sin habits, to pray and see people healed and give people God's word and say, listen, I don't know why, but the Lord told me to tell you this. That's called prophecy. And he says, do not despise prophecy in scripture. We'll help you. We'll help you, we'll help you receive but we want to prep you. I want you to know, I'm believing God for a church <laughs> that people run up to me and say, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. I was at work, and man, my boss started doing what he does, and all I could picture in my mind was stabbing him in the throat. He said, but then, Pastor, all of a sudden, I said, you know what, excuse me, I need to just go sit in my truck, I'll be right back. And as I went and sat in my truck, I said, God, I'm so angry, I don't want to work here anymore, and all of a sudden, Pastor, it's like God's presence came into my truck. He began to talk to me. I began to sing. I began to talk to him. Pastor, I, something happened to me. I, don't, I can't even explain it. It's just like y'all were talking about at that encounter. And I began to pray in my little prayer language. Something began to generate. And I stepped out of that truck and I went and back to my boss and I said, now listen, I don't want to disrespect you, but you're not going to treat me like that anymore. And I began to tell him things about his own life. He began to weep, Pastor. It was crazy. We got down, I got, we got down on our knees. He accepted Jesus right there out in front of the shop. It was crazy. Man, God's good. I want every one of you to have stories like that weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Encounters with God. This is the life we're supposed to be living. This is the life he has for you and me. And I promise you, we'll never be the same. Would you stand with me all across the room today? I hope that this has challenged you. My goal today in this me message is to help shift your thinking. I want to shift you away from thinking that going to church and hearing a message and singing some songs is encountering God. There's so much more. I want, you to, I want you to be the next Moses, the next, the next Mary, the next Peter. I want, you, I want you to be that for our generation. No matter what you do for a living, 
to be the men and women who God is marking, and encountering him, courage, vitality, strength, power coming from you. I don't think that's just for some preacher dude or some little worship person. I believe this is what the body of Christ is supposed to be, each and every one of us. But it starts with encounters with God. I want you to close your eyes with me across the room. I want to pray with you. And here and now, I asked a question earlier, and I could see panic on some of your faces. I said, how many of you have really encountered God in the way that I'm explaining today? And you could see some of you like, I don't, I made a decision for Christ. I love God, but I can't talk about power encounters like that, Pastor. I don't know if, but some of you even would say, you know what? I went to a church one time, or I grew up in a church, and they faked a lot of these things that they called supernatural, but they were really just hype. I apologize on behalf of ministers that let that foolishness happen. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about biblically. I'm talking about what we see in the Bible. I'm talking about an encounter with God that touches you, that marks you, that shifts the way you think, shifts what you value, changes your appetites, where sin just isn't, you don't enjoy it anymore, where you're not limited anymore. Here and now, I want you with me, please, as a church, as an individual, but also corporately, to make a decision of your heart and a prayer of your heart to be, Lord, I want to encounter you in a real way, in a powerful way. For some of you, that's going to be by yourself because you, you're not comfortable having these power encounters with other people around you. For others of you, it's going to be coming to our little encounter that we're doing this Friday. For others of you, it's going to start this process today. God's going to start speaking to you, start showing up in your living room, start talking to you when you turn the TV off late at night and everybody's already in bed. He's going to start talking to you, start engaging with you, encountering you. Would you believe that? Would you believe for that with me today? Father, I pray right now for every member of Church on the Hill. Lord, I pray this wouldn't be a good little sermonette. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that that I'm speaking into the life force of this church. I'm calling forth into the lives of the men and women that call themselves part of Church on the Hill. Lord God, I'm speaking into that and saying you must encounter your God. You must know his goodness, but you also must know his power. You've got to understand how big, how great, how powerful he is and the effects that he wants to have on your life as you encounter him. Lord, I pray that, Lord God, that you begin to show up in people's bedroom late at night. Lord, I pray, Lord God, they would begin to encounter you, oh God. Lord God, in times in small group, Lord God, that they would have these moments where they all just sit and weep and sit in the chair and go, I don't don't know. It's just God's here. Lord, I pray, Lord God, when they're having little family moments, Lord, around the table, that your presence would come down upon them, and they would all just begin to sing and say, God, God is good, and and that you would encounter them and shift things, oh God, shift our appetites away from loving sin, Lord, shift us away, Lord God, from limited Christianity, Lord God, shift us, oh God, away from, Lord God, the values that have been so worldly and so caught up in the systems of this world, oh God, we want to value what you value and care about what you care about, we can't just do that consciously, Lord God, we need an encounter that marks us like the man, the blind man said, all I know is once I was blind and now I see. I can't explain it all. I can't put it all in a doctrinal discussion, but I can tell you this. I couldn't see. I encountered Jesus and now I can see. The Apostle Paul, all I know was I was trying to kill Christians and now I want to make everyone a Christian. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that our hearts will become open and the fear, the fear of of, of, of negative things, oh God, would just be removed. And Lord, the desire to know you and the fullness of who you are would begin to dominate, overtaking the fear of something else, of, of, of maybe mis- being misappropriated or, or some kind of foolishness that might would happen. Lord, let faith arise and our enemies be scattered. Now, if you keep your head bowed for just a moment, maybe you say, Pastor, I gotta be honest. You know, I'm hearing you talk about this today. That's cool and all. But I can't get past the fact that I'm pretty sure Jesus is mad at me. Maybe you'd say, you know what, Pastor, I gotta be I gotta be honest. I'm 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 so full of sin. Maybe you would explain it like this. You know, Pastor, if I died today, I wouldn't go to heaven. I can tell you that right now. Me and Jesus, we don't have a relationship. I used to have a relationship when I was a kid, but you know, life happened and I've walked away from the Lord, but but I don't want to live like this anymore. If that sounds like you, if that sounds like what's going on in your heart, your mind, I got such good news for you. You obviously love God or you wouldn't even have come in this room. Come on. Nobody psyched you out and said, oh, it's going to be a concert. You knew you were coming to church. You knew you were going to engage with your God. And yeah, I understand. Maybe you're away from me. Maybe you've never made Jesus your Lord and Savior. 
Maybe you never understood it. You knew religion, but you never really understood that to have a relationship with Jesus is the way to get to the Father. Now, the Bible says it like this. If you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, you don't have to do anything. He did it all. You just have to come into a believing relationship with him. I say it like this. Imagine if we were all at a party and my best friend Jesus was sitting over at a table and you and I were hanging out and I was like, oh my goodness, you need to come meet my best friend Jesus. And I brought you over and y'all got to talking and starting a relationship. That's what I want to do for you today. I want to connect you with Jesus. And the Bible says to do that, you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is the Christ. What will happen is as you start that relationship with him, he will begin to cleanse you. He will begin to change you as you put your faith in Him. So today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to pray for anyone and pray with anyone who says, Pastor, I want that. I want a relationship with Jesus. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to make my life right with the Lord. No one's looking around. I want to pray for you. Now, I I don't want to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you forward and point you out. and Everybody's going to jump up and down. Yay, she finally did it. This is a deep private, sincere, eternal decision you need to make here and now. And as you contemplate it, if you say, yes, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Yes, I want to be forgiven of my sins. Then I'd like to pray with you. I'm going to pray with you right where you stand. I'm not going to embarrass you, point you out. But I do need you to take a step of faith. I need you to take a step of courage and admit it to yourself. Admit it to me, the pastor, and admit it to heaven that you need Jesus in your life. And I'd like you to do that by lifting your hand. You say, Pastor, that's me. I'm away from Jesus. I want to be a Christian, and I want to ask Jesus into my life. I need you to own that by lifting your hand right where you're at, and I'll pray with you. God bless you, sir. Thanks for your honesty. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your sincerity. Thank you, sir. God bless you. You'll never be the same. Thank you. Give you a couple more seconds. Just let God, if if you're ready for that, I want want to lead you in a prayer of repentance. Anyone else? No one's looking. It's just me, you, and heaven. Amen. Okay, you put your hands back down. I saw it. I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance, a prayer of dedication, a prayer of declaring Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's nothing magical about the words. What's supernatural is you said, yes, I want God. All the prayer is is an exclamation mark at the end of the sentence. We're going to seal the deal. Write our name, bottom of the page. We belong to him from this point forward. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have you repeat this prayer, and I'm going to ask everyone in the audience to pray alongside of you out loud. And I want you to mean it from all of your heart. Let's say it like this. Jesus, today I admit I'm a sinner. And I know that I've sinned against you. But I ask you now, please forgive me. Here and now, I give you my life. Jesus, I declare you are my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. I embrace your forgiveness and what you did on the cross for me. Write my name in your book of life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I promise to serve you all the days of my life in Jesus' name. Keep your head bowed for just a moment. Father, I pray for every man and woman who raised their hand, who said, yes, I want God in my life. Yes, I want to repent of my sin. I pray right now they would feel the forgiveness washing over them. That they don't have to carry shame and guilt because they're not good enough. Lord, I pray right now they would recognize they have become a son or a daughter of the Most High God. And even, even though they may sin, Lord God, they're still forgiven. And even though, Lord God, they may, they, may, they may feel guilty and shame that they can tell that go away because I belong to Jesus Christ. And Lord, that the forgiveness will never run out. The more they repent, the more cleanliness. Lord God, the enemy will lose his grip. And so, Father, we declare that now. And Lord, I ask for the joy. The Bible calls it the joy of our salvation. I pray, Lord, inside of them they'll start feeling giddy. Like, <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't have to have shame anymore. I'm forgiven. I belong to Jesus now. I, I may not be perfect, but I am forgiven. And I, I may not do everything right, but I am his son. I am his daughter. May they have that revelation right now. Father, I thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your ministry to us today. And Lord, we're asking you for crazy cool encounters with you every day of our life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.